good morning. I need, real quick, I need two volunteers to help me do a little fitness uh, demonstration. Got to be able to lift 25 pounds. All right, don't rush the stage real quick. Need two people. Two people, come on up. Who we got? Come on up, come on up. All right, here we go. Two strapping guys. Nice. Come on up here on the stage real quick. If y'all just kind of spread out for me a little bit. All right, so I got a dumbbell. Let's call it 25 pounds, right? Uh, you're going to get a pool noodle. All right, so pick it up. Give me, give me a, just give me a couple of reps. Right on. All right, feel good, comfortable? You ain't sweating yet? How about you? Is it working for you? All right, so uh, just real quick, who do you think, if I gave you like, okay, next 14 days, uh, I need 10 reps, three sets, uh, once a day, at the end of the next couple of weeks, who's going to be the strongest, fittest? Who do you think? You think so? Based on, based on starting point, is that, <laughs> you're, ruining my, you're ruining my illustration here, bro. Yeah. How many of y'all think Brian would be a little bit, little bit better off? How many say the, the noodle, the noodle, a couple of you, not so much. It's interesting. It's interesting. But, okay, but this, this is a lot easier, right? Yeah. That's a lot easier. You could do a lot more reps with those, right? Yeah. So isn't that better? Yeah. I mean, you could go forever with that, right? Yeah. At, at some point, I mean, that's looking, you're not really straining, but at some point, I mean, you're going to reach, you know, your, your limit. A lot quicker than this. So why would you want to work out? Why would you want to work out with this? Well, why not choose that? You can do it. You can do a lot more reps with that. Push myself to the limit. Okay. So so you need what? <laughs> resistance. So it takes resistance to get stronger. Interesting. 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 I like this. Easier. Easier doesn't always get you where you want to go, right? No. Interesting. Hmm, yeah, here a lot. Hmm, hmm. All right, I appreciate you guys. All right, thanks. Let's hang on to that for a little bit. It's an interesting concept. Yeah. No, you're cool. Just leave it there. We'll let Ethan come up and trip on it if he's coming back. Um, yeah, interesting concept the Bible teaches all over the place. Uh, easy isn't always better, right? Struggle makes us stronger. Get all of that. Uh, I was a little afraid to actually get even back up here before I jump in too much because my son William Barrett preached for me last week and did such a good job that, uh, yeah, and I mean, it's not just because he's my son. If you don't believe me, go back and watch. Uh, made me look bad. Like, I've been doing this for years, and just like, where did this come from? He's just walking the stage, not looking at his notes, just none of those uh, uh, verbal pauses. Just like, wow, where did this guy come from? Um, so I'm pretty proud, uh, but a little nervous to get back up here and follow his act. But what do you do when there's nothing you can do? We've been, we've been asking this question for a few weeks. What do you do when it feels like uh, you're stuck? Uh, what do you do when, like, there's a set of circumstances that just aren't going to change? Uh, this, this is just the way it is. This is the way it's going to be. It is what it is, we say, right? We're in a meanwhile season of life together, and it just seems like the goal line keeps moving farther and farther out, right? They just keep extending this, and we keep having to stay with this. Uh, but this global season, uh, it, it also may be intensifying some, some personal circumstances for you. Uh, and it's easy to come to the conclusion, right? We've been talking about these lies uh, that, that, you know, it's, it's never going to change. Where are we at? Nope. Whew. I'm never going to be happy. Again. Right? And, or we start to think, okay, nothing good can come from this. Uh, and, and the last thing you want to hear is some preacher get up here uh, and just try to sell you on, oh, there, there, there's something that could good can, can come from this because your situation might be like, no, let me get up here and tell you my story uh, and what I'm going through uh, and give me the mic and you'll understand nothing good's coming from what I'm going through. Uh, and then there's this tendency to think like, yeah, there's no point in even going on. Why even try? There's, there's no point in even trying to be responsible. There's no point in, in trying to take care of my body right now. There's no point in being kind. There's no point in being generous. It's not getting me anywhere. There's just, there's just no point in going on at all. But then every once in a while, okay, you, you bump into that unique individual or that unique couple, and, and you tell them what you're going through. You tell them your sad story, and you're thinking you're going to get some pity or some compassion. But then they tell you their story and what they're going through, uh, and, and you kind of all of a sudden are sorry you even shared what you were going through with them, right? And yet somehow, in, in spite of what they're dealing with, they, they have joy. Uh, they ha somehow have a confidence going forward. They somehow continue to pray. They, they keep believing in God in spite of, right? And it seems, like, it seems like God isn't coming through for them either. And yet there's just 
There's something extraordinary about that when you meet someone uh, that, that can do that. But you know what? Even though we get so focused on what's not happening, oftentimes there are good things that are happening. There are other things going on. It's, it's easy for us, and I get this, to, to get focused on the prayers that God's not answering for us. Uh, and we lose sight of what God is up to in our lives. So, so that's really what this whole Meanwhile series has been about. Now, if you're a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus, it's easy uh, to, to kind of just hear this uh, as, as a routine. If you're not a Christian, it's easy to uh, dismiss Christianity as sort of, yeah, that's just pie-in-the-sky teaching. That's what I expect a preacher to say, just wishful thinking. And I get that, too. A lot of Christians would, would in fact, leave you with that impression sometimes. But even if, if you're not a Christian, even if you never become a Christian, and for those of you that maybe you're watching today, you're here today, you're coming back to faith, maybe you're struggling with some doubts, uh, remember this, okay? The people that shared these principles, the people that wrote the New Testament, the Old Testament, uh, the, the people that brought us the accounts of Jesus, these were men and women who were very familiar with adversity. Like, they went through things in their lives that we would never uh, it want to, 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 uh, to anybody experience especially compared to like our modern experiences and what we deal with. And yet these were men and women who also believed, had a really strong faith. And these were men and women who maintained their faith through all of their suffering. And for them, okay, and this is so odd for some of us, okay, but, but for them there was, there was no conflict between God being a good God and bad things happening to good people. Uh, you just don't find that when you read their accounts. They didn't struggle the way we struggle with the idea of a good God and so good things have happened. And if, uh, since God uh, didn't allow good things to happen, God must not be good. Uh, they seem to understand something about God that's easy for at least me to, uh, to miss. And so what I want us to think about just for a few minutes today is, is this one word. Now, the New Testament authors, and Jesus in particular, he kept reemphasizing it over and over and over again. It's a word you probably wouldn't think about if you see it in church, because we hear it all the time. We've talked about it a lot before, uh, what it means, what we think it means, what it really means, especially when we find ourselves in a season like we're going through right now, and you're encouraged to continue doing this. Believe. Continue to believe. Uh, and, and there's something very, very, very specific, though, that we are taught to believe. Uh, but, okay, before we even get into that, intuitively, we, we don't believe this. In fact, if you're just left on your own, we think just the opposite most of the time. And yet, beginning with Jesus and the apostles over and over and over again, we're told that when we face adversity, when we're in a set of circumstances that just start to seem like our new reality, and we don't want it to be our new reality, and we want to go back to the way things were, it's not going to change, it's not going to be better, this is just the way it is, and it's just going to be the way it's going to be, there's something very specific that we are to embrace and believe in, in this meanwhile season. And if you're not a Christian, okay, there's something in this for you as well. But if you are a follower of Jesus, uh, this is so central to what we've been taught in the New Testament as it relates to, to meanwhile. Uh, and this has a lot of credibility uh, for me because the person who wrote this is James. And, uh, and James had a very famous brother. Anybody know who that was? Jesus, right, good. If you've been here before, we've talked about that before. Uh, and what makes James, uh, in fact, what this makes it so interesting to me is that, that James, the brother of Jesus, he didn't even show up at all in the ministry of Jesus in those years. You don't read about James. Uh, it's, it's like Jesus kind of just, just ignored most of his family, distanced himself from his family. And, and then when you read the Gospels, James doesn't show up in any of those accounts. Uh, he wasn't one of the disciples. Uh, he wasn't even a follower of Jesus during Jesus' ministry. He's never quoted. It's just like he's not even there. Uh, and then, okay, at the end, after the crucifixion, James suddenly shows up, and he shows up as the primary leader in the church in Jerusalem. He's like the guy. Like, like he and Peter up there in Jerusalem, they're like the two guys. Uh, and, and Peter was a disciple. Jesus was the, or James was the brother of Jesus, and James suffered enormously. Because of his faith in his brother, uh, which should make you at least wonder why, okay? Because, uh, and we've asked this before, somebody asked, what would it take for you to believe that your own brother, what would it take for him to convince you that he was the son of God? You're like, okay, you can do some cool stuff, but bro, you're not, you're not all that, right? James came to that conclusion that his brother was his Lord. Well, what convinced him, okay? It wasn't the teachings of Jesus, 
it, it wasn't the miracles of Jesus. It wasn't even the crucifixion of Jesus. James became convinced because of the resurrection of Jesus. Something happened. It changed his mind. And then suddenly after the resurrection, James comes to the forefront. Uh, anyway, now th- th- this is so interesting. i got to get on with the message. But James wrote something. Uh, and you have access to something that was written 2,000 years ago by somebody who actually grew up with and hung out with and knew Jesus. Now, I just think that's pretty cool. So James, the brother of Jesus, he writes this letter primarily to Jewish believers in the first century. And, and, and right after introducing himself, he just jumps right into uh, the hard part. He says this. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. To which, okay, if you've never heard this before, and I said this to you, or somebody that wasn't writing the Bible said this to you, you'd be like, well, no, I'm not going to do that because that doesn't even make sense, right? Uh, you know, uh, even if you knew this was in the Bible, you might respond with, well, that's crazy. crazy. Troubles, troubles are not opportunities for joy, uh, right? Uh, James would say, okay, I know, I know. Hold on, I'm just getting started. I want you to consider it pure joy, though, my brothers and sisters, when you face adversity, when something takes you by surprise, right? When the doctor calls and it's not good news, or your sister calls, or, or you show up to, go, to work and you, you get bad news. or you know, Instead of assuming the worst right away, I want you to think about adversity differently. And I want you to consider it as possibly the source of something good, something that could make you better. Uh, And then, okay, this is something I would probably never try to tell you because you would think I was nuts and crazy too. This is James, but he continues. Look at verse 3. He says, for you know that when your faith is tested, all right? And we have to hit the pause button here for just a second because this is an enormously enormously important sentence, I think. James affirms what we kind of already suspect, kind of what we already know. uh, That He underscores that, that whenever you're hitting a bump in life, when things are not going your way, when you're having one of those days, it tests your faith as a believer, doesn't it? I mean, we just got to be honest about that, right? It tests the integrity of your faith when you run up against something and you don't feel like God's coming through for you the way he should. The troubles almost put your faith on trial, don't they? Troubles can feel even sometimes like they're putting God on trial, uh, don't they? I mean, troubles can, uh, you know, God, I always believed. I've always done what I was supposed to do, right? Uh, I've been a good person. Are you kidding me, God? Why would you allow me to go through this? Why would you allow my family, someone I love, to have to deal with that? He says, you know that when your faith is tested, not if, but when your faith is tested, do you really believe, okay? Will you continue to believe? Can you, uh, essentially, to sort of sum it up, tests or troubles uh, will test our confidence in God. Don't they? Think about this. And, and I'm just glad he added that little part before he gets into the, the, the practical stuff because it lets us know uh, he knows what we're thinking, that this isn't just preacher talk, right? Uh, he's not crazy. He continues. He says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Troubles produce enduring faith. And that's his point, that troubles endure, uh, produce enduring faith. Now, some preachers would have you believe that uh, you know, real faith always gets a yes from God. And I don't know if you've ever been under this kind of teaching. And this is why a lot of people, maybe somebody you know or, or maybe even yourself, you struggle with faith. Because at some point, you were told that if you just have enough faith, God will come through. Uh, but, but that's not what Jesus or any of the New Testament authors actually taught. God is most glorified by enduring faith. Now, here's the deal, okay? Faith that always seems to get a yes from God, just think about this. Uh, no one is really impressed by that. Uh, most practical people might even, even doubt someone who says God always comes through for me uh, because we know that's not real life. That's, that's superstition maybe. That's, that's magic. That's uh, you know, manipulation. That's prosperity preaching, whatever you want to call it. The faith that impresses you the most, and I don't even know you, but I know this about you, Uh, Because we're all in the same in this regard. The faith that impresses us the most is that faith that gets a no from God. Or that faith that gets a a, a no answer from God right away. And yet they continue to endure in their faith anyway. That's impressive. It's not the faith that always gets a yes, right? I prayed on Thursday and on Friday. Woo, God came through, right? Or, you know, I lost my job on Monday. I got a better job on Wednesday because I just prayed and I had real faith. I mean, that's awesome when it happens, but when we hear those stories, you, you know what we think? We think, 
Okay, I want to know the trick. I want to know the formula. I want to know how that happened. What did you do? Teach me how to do that too. I want to know the math. We don't, we don't fall in love with God. We don't learn to trust God and, and believe God and have faith in God anymore. We fall in love with, okay, tell me what you did so I can do that too, uh, so I can get what you got. And God must be thinking, right, are you kidding? Okay, that doesn't honor me. That doesn't show any trust and faith in me. Let me tell you what honors me. It's the person that believes anyway. It's the person that trusts me anyway. It's the person that perseveres, that endures anyway. And throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, God is glorified by enduring faith. That's why James says, okay, now look, when the bottom falls out, uh, when things are tough, before you just go into a nosedive, before you hit the eject button too, too quickly, before you quit praying, before you tear up your Bible, before you just swear off and stop going back to church, just wait, 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 wait. And then he answers the question, okay, what is it that God is up to? God is up to developing enduring faith. But let's just be honest, okay? Let's, let's be even gut level honest about this. We don't, we don't want enduring faith, right? I mean, we don't want that. We want the quick fix. I don't want to do 10 weeks of 20 reps and whatnot to get big muscles. Give me a pill, right? Uh, give me that ab blaster thing. Whatever. I, want, I want quick fix. Uh, we don't want enduring faith. But enduring faith is honoring to God. And troubles produce enduring faith. And so then James gets to the why. Why should, we, why should we want that instead of the quick fix? And this is his main point. The thing he wants us to take away as it relates to somehow seeing bad things as good things and bad seasons as opportunities. He says this in verse 4. He says, so let it grow. This is a choice, okay? You don't have to let it grow. Uh, I mean, you can hit the eject button, you can hit the divorce button, you can hit the bankruptcy button, you can, you can hit the alcohol button, the weed button, the, the just hit the run button, right? You can hit the lie button. You can hit all kinds of buttons to try to relieve your pain, relieve your circumstances. But James says, no, wait, okay? God is up to something. So let it grow. Give it a chance. Give it an opportunity. Okay, but why would I choose to do that, James? Because, okay, here's the tension. Your greatest tension in life can be the focal point of God's activity in your life if you choose to trust. But you'll never know if you don't trust. But that, that thing, that thing that's weighing on you right now, this is what he's saying. That thing in your life that you wouldn't wish on anybody, right? And you would love to wish it away and you wish you could go back and somehow undo that thing. Uh, that very thing can be the focal point of God's activity in your life if you would allow it to be by allowing endurance to grow. You see, for some of you, okay, your story, and I'm not making fun, uh, but we, we, we're trying to build a different kind of church here. And, and this season is allowing some of that to even, uh, even be more true about us. But, but we're trying to build a place where people that are coming back to faith can, can feel safe to come and ask their questions. And uh, for people, you know, it's kind of what we do. This is what makes us different as a kind of a church. We love it. But the story I've heard so often, and maybe this is part of your story, is that, okay, at some point in the past, you hit a bump. Or, uh, you know, or maybe you just full on hit the eject button. I'm done. Uh, you abandon faith. You abandon God. Or you abandon the Bible. You abandon church. Whatever your deal was, you just, you just walked away from it all. Because something bad happened and you couldn't reconcile it. And, and instead of considering it as an opportunity for growth, instead of enduring, instead of trusting God anyway, you hit the eject button. And, and, and let's be honest, okay? I, I get that. But if you'll be honest with me, that didn't make your life any better. The problem probably didn't go away. You didn't just find the answers you were looking for all of a sudden. I mean, there may be exceptions, but the stories I've heard over and over are not, okay, you know, when I was younger, when I was in college, this happened, and I walked away from God, and I'm so glad I did. Good riddance, right? But I made better decisions after that, right? And I mean, healthier, my relationships got better. I'm just, I'm now more generous. I'm more compassionate, right? I'm just a better person once I got God out of the picture. Now, people might want to spend that that on the surface but but it's not their real story i mean generally what we hear is something bad happens and it's like well god if if that's how it is if that's who you are then just forget it you know i went to this church and my parents got divorced and then they just kind of blacklisted and threw my mom out so i left too or you know i, I got pregnant and they didn't know what to do with that or they found out my brother was gay and they didn't know what to do with that so we just walked away from the whole thing and I'd like to paint a picture that my life got better when I did that, but I got bitter, not better. Uh, and in reality, my life got a little more complicated because I'm still looking for answers to those inescapable questions. And James would say, look, okay, listen, I'm not judging you. 
Uh, and I'm not even upset with you. I'm just saying, don't make that mistake again. Because right now, in this moment, you have an opportunity to rethink things. you got a preacher who's trying to get your attention, and God's trying to get his atten- your attention through him. So listen up. Let endurance finish its work this time. Let it grow, because at the end of the process, your enduring faith is going to bring more honor to God, and it's going to leave you in a better place. You get stronger. Okay, here's how he explains it. He says, so let it grow for when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Like endurance, you complete me, right? That's what he's saying. There's, there's actually a cool wordplay going on here that, that we don't pick up on in English, though. But the Greek word he uses for fully developed, it's the same Greek word he uses actually for perfect and complete. Uh, he's basically saying, okay, when endurance has done its work, when it's fully developed, you'll be fully developed, Right? Let endurance complete its work so you'll be complete. In other words, okay, if you don't allow endurance to complete its work, if you jump ship, if you, if you abandon too prematurely, you're never going to get where you want to be. You're never going to be complete. You're always going to be missing something. You'll still be needing something. I mean, Jesus taught this over and over again as well. And the truth is, let's just be honest. I mean, common sense even kind of argues for this. Uh, even though we don't like to face it, there, there's something about enduring troubles that makes us stronger. Right? I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger didn't didn't win awards by lifting pool noodles. Right? He put himself through some pain, some struggle to get there. Uh, And and there's just something about perseverance that makes us go deeper. We have to wrestle with some really, really hard questions that can actually bring us to a deeper, more broad understanding of things. There's something about endurance that makes our story more attractive. And this may be a new idea, like especially if you grew up in church. But really the truth is, and this is taught throughout Scripture, spiritual maturity is measured in terms of enduring faith, not perfect behavior. Now think about this. Like, like have you ever met... Like super Christian, you ever known this person? Like somebody was so good. They were so spiritual. They were like, you know, super, uh, super, super believer. They were sickening. It's like, really, do you do you ever struggle with anything? Like, do you ever frown? Do you ever get, you know, tempted even? You know, I never, I always, I never, always, I never, always. Uh, and, and you didn't want you don't want to go out to lunch with that person, um, right? You didn't want to be around them. You were likely suspicious uh, and didn't even really trust them, did you? Like you're full of it. Uh, you kind of looked at them like they belong you know, somewhere in the zoo or something. Like, come here, I want you to look at something. This is a person that's never done anything wrong. Wow, uh, that's amazing. She always has perfect faith. Whoa. I mean, you, you appreciate the morals. You appreciate the ethics and everything, right? But it's kind of like saying that saying you've heard of too heavenly minded for no earthly good. I don't know if you've ever known anybody like that. But, but then you get to know them maybe a little bit more. And you sort of scratch beneath the surface and you realize, no. Okay, I understand now why you're so good. Uh, because life's been really good to you. And, and if life had been as good to me as it's been to you, then, then I'd be that good too. I, if I grew up in a perfect family, then maybe I'd be more perfect like you, right? If God gave me your looks and your background and you're perfect, perfect, perfect. I mean, I'm not telling you to run out and do something bad, but I'm just saying you're not necessarily inspiring to me. You're kind of intimidating to me. And then you meet a different kind of Christian. You meet a Christian that's been through some junk. They, you hear their story about, you know, marching right down into the valley of the shadow of death. And it sounds like God just let them camp there for a while. Uh, and, and they didn't always get things right. They don't always say things right. They don't really have a Sunday school background, can't recite all the verses and the stories. But their confidence in God is just so stinking deep. Like even right now, they're not wavering. It's, it's attractive. And it's a little bit intimidating too, but it's intimidating in a way that I want some of that. Because at some point later in their story, right after months, after weeks, maybe even years, that God brought them out of all of that mess. And when they tell their story, maybe even with some rough, non-churchy kind of language, it's just like you listen to their story and you think, man, I'm just glad to know that that kind of faith exists. I'm glad to know you, you can face that kind of adversity and go through that kind of junk and come out on the other side still believing and even stronger. And they say things like this, you know, I would, I would never want to go through that again, but I wouldn't take it away for anything because of everything I learned, because of what it did for me. And, and you're inspired, not, not by their perfect obedience and their perfect life, but and not even by their Bible knowledge. You know, they, they may have got some of that. You're inspired by the depth of their confidence in God. And, and you wonder to yourself, you know, I, I'm not sure I would have trusted God through those circumstances. That's inspiring. You know what they did? Okay, you know what, why that kind of thing is so moving to a lot of us? They allowed endurance to complete its work. 
to grow until fully developed. You, you just met a mature believer. And yes, okay, maybe now they're more obedient. They've learned some Bible knowledge, but they've got real maturity now. They're complete. They've not been made complete because they acted perfectly. They've been made complete because in the valley, they didn't hit the eject button. They let endurance complete its work. So, so to put this all together, okay, here's what James is saying. He's saying that when you're surprised by adversity, maybe you're going through a season and then it just gets worse. When the bottom drops out, you didn't deserve it. Things are constantly changing, right? You don't even know what's coming tomorrow. There's nothing you can do about it. You get a phone call. You get, you get that letter and you're just thinking, I don't even want to open this, right? Suddenly, no fault of your own, your world's upside down. He says, don't so quickly assume the worst. Don't assume that, that God has abandoned you. Don't assume that God is angry with you. Don't assume God doesn't care. He says, I want you to change your way of thinking. This is a choice. But I want you to reconsider. I want you to choose to consider there is something good that can come out of this. Because this is a test of your faith. And the only way to build enduring faith is the same way we build a muscle, right? you got to tear it up and let it grow. Tear it up and let it grow. You stretch it and rest it. You stretch it and rest it, right? You work it and rest it. And God is up to something. He's building endurance. He's building strength. He's building faith in you. So let faith, let endurance finish its work. Let it grow, he says. Here's the shorter version, basically, is that you endure to mature. It's a life principle, right? It's what the Bible teaches us. You endure to mature. The maturity is not okay. It's not just about how much you know and how smart you are. It's not even just about obedience that makes you look good. Uh, you know, and, and that's all good. But maturity comes when bad things happen and you choose to believe and endure anyway. You choose to believe that God will use what he doesn't choose to remove. And, and that's basically my homework assignment for this week, all right? Each time you're reminded... And it'll happen before this day's over with, right? Probably more than once. That this world is an unsettling place right now. And, and all the COVID stats that we're reading on both extremes, it'll leave your mind spinning, right? And, and the lack of coins out there and, and, and the, the stupid masks and the schooling issues and all this stuff. Okay, each time you feel this trouble starting to pull you back down, I want you to pray this prayer, okay? Put this in your vocabulary. God, I believe you will use this until you choose to remove this. This is a choice. Okay, this is, this is a mind-changing choice in prayer. God, I believe. Heavenly Father, I believe. I'm choosing to believe. Like my friends might think I'm crazy, but I'm choosing to believe that you will use this until you choose to remove this. And meanwhile, meanwhile, God, just grant me the wisdom. Grant me the perspective to see things the way you see. Give me the strength to do as you say. Meanwhile, God, I'm new to this. I'm not made for this. God, I can't do this on my own. God, I'm immature, and I don't know much about this, and this is the first time I've even tried, and so I need some wisdom. Please give me the wisdom to see things the way that you see them. But God, I believe you'll use this until you choose to remove this. And, and, and can I just make a suggestion? As you do this, as you pray this, this is just me, but I, I want to suggest that you actually pray this out loud. Like you hear yourself saying these words. Uh, you know, maybe not like right in front of the cashier or the the waitress or anything like that. They might take it the wrong way. But, you know, there's just something about praying out loud. Maybe, maybe you know, like in the privacy of your home, you wake up in the morning before you go to bed at night. When, when you're driving in your car, God, I believe you're going to use this until you choose to remove this. This is insane. This is crazy. God, I, I, I just can't. But you can. And so I believe you're going to use this. Meanwhile. Until you choose to remove this. God, give me your perspective. Give me your wisdom. Give me your strength. And when you pray this, okay, that's a way of you allowing your endurance to grow. It's the opposite of hitting the easy button. You're not hitting the eject button. You're allowing endurance to grow, to finish its work. It's how God builds in you the kind of confidence in God that's so inspiring to people that it draws people to your heavenly Father too. And he will use it until he chooses to remove it. Let me just pray for you. Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you so much for allowing us to read these words uh, that James uh, learned, I'm sure, uh, the hard way as well. God, I just thank you so much for, uh, for James. who showed up a little bit later than some of the other writers, but when he did, God, he was just so bold, and it's inspiring to us. He was so confident, and we want that, that kind of confidence too, God. Thank you for the courage it gives us uh, by, by, by seeing him confess his brother as Lord. And so, Father, as we think about what we're going through, the junk that we might be facing right now, the circumstances, the, the frustrations, maybe the real hard challenges, God, we, we believe that right there in the middle of our greatest tension is, is possibly where your greatest opportunity to work in our lives is. 
And so, God, we just ask you to give us the faith to allow that to happen. And we invite you to do what you need to do in us. And, Father, we're not choosing to run. We're not choosing to abandon. We're not going to give up. We're choosing to allow endurance to grow in us. So, God, give us each the wisdom to know what to do with what we just heard. And, God, give us the courage to go out of here today and do it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.